Hi, I'm Mallory Smith, and I have cystic fibrosis. I feel like people with CF are privy to secrets it takes most other people a lifetime to understand. How lucky we are to be alive. How we should be appreciative of anything that's in our control. That we can leave behind a legacy when we go that will impact others. I'm Diane Shader Smith. Mallory was my daughter. Losing her was catastrophic, but I'm not here today to talk about that. Rather, I want to talk about her life and her legacy with the hope that hearing her story will inspire you to think about yours. We all want to leave our mark on the world, to know that our life mattered. But legacy means different things to different people. Some think it's about a gift that you leave. Others think it's about leaving something in people rather than for them. I think legacy is important because it gives those of us left behind something to cling to. As you heard in the speech, in the film, Mallory knew that she had a legacy that would impact others. In fact, she writes, I have a strong urge to write something that will change people. I want it to be like handing them a pair of glasses, giving them a way of seeing something they didn't even realize they weren't seeing. When Mallory was three, we learned she had cystic fibrosis, a progressive genetic disease that affects the lungs, the sinuses, and the GI tract. Her symptoms were a persistent cough, a chronic runny nose, and massive bowel movements, the first sign of malabsorption and the beginning of her lifelong problems with her GI tract. Once she was diagnosed, the doctors had her doing long medical treatments every day and she hated them. So every day when it was time to start, she would run and hide, sometimes under the bed, sometimes in the closet, anywhere she thought we wouldn't find her. So my husband Mark, Mallory's father, made up a game he called Astronaut and Pat Pat. Astronaut was for the mask that delivered the inhaled medications, and Pat Pat was for the chest percussion therapy. I was desperate for a way to explain the disease to Mallory, to her brother Micah, and to our community, but there was no book for children back then about cystic fibrosis. So I wrote one, Mallory's 65 Roses. 65 Roses is what kids hear when adults say cystic fibrosis. We read it to her class every September, gave a copy to each of her friends, and even the boys when she started dating, because it gave her an easy way to talk about her illness, which at that point was invisible. Over time, Mallory got used to her treatments, and they just became part of our day-to-day -day life. But when Mallory was nine, she came home one day, and she said, I am not doing treatment anymore, I hate it. She was understandably sick of it. I tried every trick in the book to get her to do it, but nothing worked. So Mark and I sat her down on the couch. We looked her in the eye, and Mark said words no parent ever wants to say to their child. He said, Mallory, we don't ask you to do treatment to punish you. We ask you to do treatment so you don't die. It was the first time we introduced the idea to Mallory that CF could be fatal. Mallory jumped up, ran out of the room, and didn't speak to us for three days. But after that, she never missed a treatment. And she started writing a diary back then, first in spiral-bound notebooks, and then when she turned 15, she used a computer. So who was Mallory, and what is her legacy? First and foremost, she was a girl who loved life and was determined to live it to the fullest. She and her brother Micah bonded early on over their love of pancakes, Harry Potter, and their furry four-legged friends. Mallory loved to read. She watched movies, went to parties. She was a three-sport varsity athlete, prom queen, and she had the most amazing friends. 
Her passion was for the environment, and she wrote her senior thesis comparing the degradation of her lungs by the colonization of a superbug to the degradation of native Hawaii by the colonization of foreigners. In college, she worked hard, got good grades, played club volleyball, and graduated Stanford Phi Beta Kappa. After she graduated, she got hired to write an important environmental book that got a lot of attention, called The Gottlieb Native Garden, A California Love Story. She was a pretty typical, high-achieving young woman, except she lived every day knowing she had a chronic illness that would someday kill her. It's why she chronicled her life. She wanted to leave a record of herself for those of us who loved her. So she wrote, and she wrote, and she wrote. I always knew that Mallory was a gifted storyteller, but I didn't know that she had created poetry out of prosaic experiences because she had her journal password protected. I will admit that I did try to sneak a peek a few times, but she locked me out. 67 hospitalizations, each one ranging from weeks to months, has a way of bonding you. Mallory and I were joined at the hip, incredibly close, and I knew so much about her life, but still I was dying to know what was in the journal. Towards the end of her life, we had a fight, a typical mother-daughter one, and she ran out of the room and started pounding on her laptop. At that point, I assumed her journal was just gonna be a repository for her anger at me, and I imagined her detailing every single thing that I had ever done wrong as a mother, which was a terrifying thought. But when she was at UPMC, the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, listed for a double lung transplant, she gave me her password. She didn't want me to read her journal, but she was afraid she might not make it, and she thought if she passed away, she wanted me to have it. At that point, it was such a sacred gift that I couldn't possibly betray her confidence, so I did not open it. Mallory leaves a second legacy as the catalyst for phage therapy, a long forgotten and little known treatment that's good for treating superbugs. A superbug is a bacteria that's resistant to all antibiotics. The World Health Organization estimates that by 2050, 10 million people per year will die from superbugs, making it one of the most pressing global health issues. A Time Magazine article put a face to this problem when it featured Mallory's case. What happened was that Mark, when talking to the doctors three weeks before Mallory was gonna die, in response to their saying they were out of options and we had to start preparing for the worst, he asked for phage therapy. He had done research and had tried to get it a few years earlier, but each time his request had fallen on deaf ears. At this point, Dr. Paluski and Dr. DeCuna said yes, and they were all in. And together with the help of Stephanie Strathdee, an epidemiologist and we call part-time phage wrangler, they were able to harness the resources from labs across the country to get a cocktail that would treat Mallory's bug. But sadly, it arrived 12 hours before she passed away. She did get the first dose, but upon autopsy, we learned that it was in fact starting to work. What that means is it had reached the target and was beginning to multiply. When she passed away, Mark turned to me and he said, I couldn't save my daughter, but I want to save others. So together we worked with the press and we made Mallory's story public. We worked with several outlets, in fact. And what happened since that time is that several other patients have been successfully treated with phage therapy. Three important things have happened since we made Mallory's case public. The FDA has approved the first ever phage therapy clinical trial. We have established Mallory's Legacy Fund at the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation to support the trial and a second center that's also doing work. And two researchers who readily say they were inspired by Mallory's case have created the first ever phage therapy data bank. While all this was happening, it was just too painful for me to think that if Mallory had gotten phage therapy sooner, if the doctors had listened to Mark, that she would still be alive. So I let this be Mark work, Mark's work, which he is continuing to do now. And I turned myself to the journal. 
I first opened the journal the day of Mallory's memorial. I was looking for something to say about her in her words, and I was stunned to find 2,500 pages chronologically organized over 10 years from the time she was 15 until her death at the age of 25. Inside were the playful writings of a teenager, the somber insights of a young woman facing death, and absolutely no expression of anger at me. It was the most precious and unexpected gift a grieving mother could receive. I was drowning when Mallory died, but she left me a lifeboat, which was typical of her as she was always thinking of others, and her lifeboat came in the form of instructions. The first thing, she did not want me to show anybody the unedited version of the journal. She didn't want to hurt somebody that she might have railed against in a moment of anger, violate a friend's confidence because she wrote about all of their antics, or expose her father or her brother to intimate details of her love life. She did want me to publish the parts that she thought would help others. By all accounts, Mallory's insights and writing are extraordinary. She writes about the need for balance with pain management during the opioid epidemic in terms of over and under medicating pain management. She writes about insurance obstacles and access to health care, about the difficulty of knowing when to disclose an invisible illness, about the fear, depression, and anxiety that go hand in hand with chronic illness, about learning to live with loss, about the importance of deep and meaningful friendship, her longing for love, which she found with Jack at the end, and her intense desire to have a child. Per her wishes, I had her journal published, and we are donating all the profits. The press has been absolutely amazing. One example, Robin Abkarian writes, Salt in My Soul, An Unfinished Life by Mallory Smith is a memoir unlike any other. It's, ex and it's, it's an exquisitely nuanced chronicle of a terrified but hopeful young woman whose life was beginning and ending all at once. Mallory wanted her words to be a comfort to those of us who loved her. But what I've come to understand from traveling the country and speaking to so many groups who didn't know Mallory is that her words are inspiring and comforting to them as well. But it is not just her words that leave all of us in awe. During Mallory's lifetime, she stood proud as the face of Mallory's Garden, our annual fundraiser for cystic fibrosis. She helped us raise $5 million, all of which has gone to research. Mallory's life and legacy, and the incredible work that she's done, has led me to think about my own, my life and what I want to leave behind. I've had quite a remarkable life, but the most important thing to me has been Micah and Mallory's mom. And to that end, I'm going to continue to share Mallory's story and try to parent Micah with love and support, because as her brother, he was often in the shadow of his larger-than-life sister. We're all heartbroken that Mallory isn't here to see what she's created, but we have come to understand that a heartbreaking ending can be the beginning of a triumph. Mallory's legacy is in her wit, her wisdom, and her words, the salt in her soul. Thank you.